I will never forget the overwhelming feeling that consumed me when I discovered my wife and best friend's infidelity and realized that my marriage was in jeopardy. Although I do not consider myself religious, the irony of the situation is not lost on me. The downfall of my marriage began on Good Friday, a day traditionally associated with mourning. According to the Bible, Good Friday marks the crucifixion and death of Jesus. His disciples at that time had lost all hope and grieved the end of his life. Little did they know that he would soon experience resurrection, leading to a new and joyous life. Similarly, on that very day, I had no inkling that I was about to embark on a dark phase of my life, which would eventually lead me to a path of greater happiness. Coincidentally, it was also the day preceding our youngest son's first birthday celebration. This milestone event commemorated the moment when I sat by my wife's side in the hospital room, witnessing a delivery that was filled with fear and necessitated swift decisions with the doctor. Amidst tears, we held hands and professed our love for each other. I observed an expression of fear upon her face, one that I had never seen before. She appeared disheveled, sweaty, and in pain. Nonetheless, all I saw was the person I wanted to spend my life with. Despite my own trepidation, I felt a surge of excitement as we embarked on the next chapter of our beautifully imperfect, yet perfect, journey as a family. Fast forward one year later, I had the day off from work. My wife had been grappling with stress, feeling as though she had lost her way after returning to a demanding job following a nine-month maternity leave. Thus, as a gesture of kindness, I decided to take our children out of town to my parents' house, where the birthday party was scheduled to take place allowing her to enjoy an uninterrupted night of sleep in our own bed for the first time in over two years, considering our 20-month-old toddler as well. On that particular day, she went out to lunch with her co-workers as she did every Friday. They captured pictures during their outing, and she sent some of them to me. It was evident that she was having a wonderful time. In contrast, I sent her a photo illustrating the chaos of my youngest son's high chair himself and our diarrhea-covered floor. Normally, such a picture would never cross my mind, but the messiness of the situation was beyond belief. In an attempt to find humor in life's absurdities, I found it amusing how our days appeared to be polar opposites. Please skip ahead if you find the following details unnecessary. During breakfast, my son fell ill, and somehow his diaper was shifted to the side, resulting in a disastrous flow of waste cascading across the high chair and onto the dining room floor. I had to prevent our ever-curious dog and toddler from approaching what they perceived as the most captivating finger-painting project. As I scrambled to gather garbage bags, old towels, and disinfectants, it felt like a scene from a mob movie where the characters scrambled to clean up a gruesome crime scene. Undeniably, it was a stressful endeavor, but I managed to find the humor in it and thought that sharing the photograph with my wife would earn me some appreciation for taking one for the team that day. Later on, I made a quick trip to Costco near my parents' house to purchase dinner ingredients and party supplies for the upcoming birthday celebration. I called my wife to inquire if there was anything else she needed me to pick up. However, her tone struck me as peculiar, familiar, in the sense that I recognized it as the tone she often adopted when she was in the company of others. I had never experienced jealousy before. I had always been confident in our commitment to each other and our ability to maintain our own social circles. Whether she went to bars, visited Las Vegas, or enjoyed lunches with her male colleagues, I never questioned her intentions. Thus I asked her, who are you with? Upon hearing her response of nobody, I knew she was lying. A pit had not yet formed in my stomach, but I sensed that something was amiss. So I decided to check her location using our shared Find My iPhone account. To my surprise, she was actually at a bar we had frequented before. All right, I thought to myself, Maybe she has arranged a surprise for me, meeting someone to plan something special. I wasn't entirely off base, technically speaking. Throughout the night, I intermittently monitored her movements, and she did eventually pay a visit to Old Navy. About an hour later, as I prepared a serving of instant craft macaroni and cheese, I noticed an odd texture in the bowl. For some reason, I momentarily forgot about the existence of Google and perhaps seeking more clues, decided to call her. She assured me that the texture was perfectly normal, emphasizing that the packaging indicated as much. She sounded somewhat annoyed too. Later, I discovered that he, let's refer to him as Donald for the sake of anonymity, accompanied her in the car, engaging in a conversation on speakerphone. The name Donald felt fitting since, unlike myself, he possessed strong political views and let them dominate his life. While I maintained a moderate stance, he vehemently despised anyone with conservative beliefs, 
particularly Donald Trump. Consequently, it seemed apropos to assign him the name Donald henceforth. Permit me to highlight the similarities in our situations, just to further emphasize the irony. Both individuals have a constant sense of being right, dismissing anyone who disagrees with them as unintelligent. Additionally, they both struggle with feelings of envy towards others' achievements. Despite these similarities, they also share the commonality of having terrible hair. However, a distinguishing factor is their extramarital affairs. Only the fake Donald had the audacity to publicly shame the real Donald for his infidelity, revealing the truth through a tweet after cheating on his own wife with mine. Questioning their moral and ethical values is the least one could do in light of their actions. As she admitted later, she was irritated during that moment. She even confessed to Donald and I that she felt like I was ruining her night off. In her conversation with Donald, she expressed her frustration, stating that she felt like she had three children, our two kids and me. Now, I will recount the events of that night from my perspective, although the following narrative will not be an accurate depiction of what truly occurred. In a future post, I will provide the factual details to bring clarity to the situation. While putting our boys to bed, I noticed she was at the train station. Perhaps she was meeting a friend to plan an early surprise for my birthday, or so I assumed. Although it didn't seem logical, I couldn't think of any other reason for her presence there. A couple of months earlier, she embarked on a work trip a few hours away from town and stayed at a hotel with her colleagues. Prior to the trip, she displayed signs of coldness and hostility towards me. She had returned to work at the beginning of January, facing immense challenges and stress. She believed she had lost her edge in the workplace, despite previously being valued as one of the smartest individuals in the office. Although she was already in good shape, especially for someone who had recently given birth, she continued to lose weight and bought new clothes. Personally, I found both her previous and current appearance equally appealing, and she felt the same way too. However, our sexual intimacy was lacking, not because I hadn't made an effort. With two young children and both of us juggling full-time jobs and household responsibilities, we were burning the candle at both ends. Nevertheless, I remained eager to find pleasure in the moments we had together. When she returned from her trip at the end of February, I observed a revived libido in her that I hadn't seen since she read the Fifty Shades of Grey series. At times, I would jokingly ask, what happened on your trip? I completely trusted her and never considered the possibility of an affair due to the strength of our relationship, our long history, and our shared moral values. I assumed she had simply been rejuvenated through rest and time spent away. Suddenly, she desired sex frequently, and it was as passionate as ever. I remarked on this immediate change and playfully questioned her about her trip. I would tease her as she got ready for work, showcasing her new clothes and catching glimpses of herself in the mirror, asking who the mysterious man was. Overall, I was content and secure, as I had a beautiful, intelligent, and successful wife. However, on that fateful Good Friday night, my heart sank as I began piecing together clues. The thought that she may have met someone on her trip, and now planned to meet him while I cared for the children, was a constant blow to my emotions. I tried to maintain optimism, telling myself, perhaps she is meeting a friend, but she always informed me of such meetings. I attempted to convince myself that she was planning something special for me, yet the absence of any specific occasion undermined this hope, and my continuous checking of her location contradicted the trust I was attempting to force myself to feel. Let's take a short break. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the release of new stories. Continuing the story. Later, she called me from the mall, and we conversed as I watched her phone's GPS tracking move from a different train station, conveniently located next to her office, miles away from the mall, gradually approaching our neighborhood via the freeway. Did she return to her office and fulfill a fantasy? Was she actually at the other train station? Both possibilities haunted my mind. After our conversation ended, I desperately tried to fall asleep while meticulously examining our banking app for any Taco Bell charges, which she claimed to have stopped at for dinner. I scored various social media platforms for photos taken at the bar her phone indicated, as well as both train stations that night, hoping to spot her in the background. Unfortunately, both searches yielded no evidence. I went to bed with the struggle to fall asleep, consumed by thoughts about the impending fate of my marriage, my wife, my kids, and my future. I refrained from confiding in my parents at this point. With no concrete information and a desire to avoid inadvertently revealing my suspicions to her the next day, I kept the truth to myself. 
Despite being married, I felt an increasing sense of isolation. The day after I strongly suspected my wife of infidelity, she appeared at my parents' house for our youngest son's first birthday party. I had arrived a day earlier, intending to celebrate his birthday while everyone was in town for Easter. As he was about to turn one, I couldn't shake the assumption that she might already be involved with someone else. Reflecting on that day, it's challenging to assess our interactions accurately. Both of us later acknowledged that there was an unusual chill in the air. Was it because I was emotionally distant, aware of the possible affair, or was she carrying guilt? Likely a combination of both. According to my family, the most significant snub of that year's Oscars was my absence among the nominees for concealing my inner turmoil, posing for pictures, and engaging with the children as if my heart and gut weren't in turmoil. The birthday party itself proceeded smoothly. I spent time with my kids, extended family, and lifelong friends. We enjoyed pizza, played in the bounce house, recorded videos, and gathered around the cake to sing happy birthday to my youngest. After everyone had departed, only my parents, my wife and me, my brother and his wife, and all our kids remained at the house. While she was in the shower, I seized the opportunity to check her location history on her phone, a skill I had just learned the night before. The hard evidence revealed that she had lied about her whereabouts the previous night. I discreetly captured photos with my phone to document the evidence without leaving a trace on hers. My heart pounded so intensely that I thought I could hear it in my ears. Once the kids were asleep and we were in the living room, my wife and sister-in-law indulged in wine. Our conversation spanned various topics, and as the voices grew louder, I reminded everyone to keep it down since the children were asleep. My wife shot me a disdainful look, directing a silent message to my sister-in-law as if to say, do you see the wet blanket I'm stuck with? Since our dating days, I had been uneasy when she drank. While she wasn't a daily drinker or an alcoholic, a buzz made her happier and more affable with others, especially men. Nothing physical, just friendlier and more animated in conversation. However, she always became colder towards me. I dreaded her drinking around other people when she exhibited this behavior. On the night of my son's birthday party, though, something felt different. Even my sister-in-law remembered the exact moment and expression when I brought up that day with her eight months later. And remember, no one except me was aware of the events that had transpired the day before. The following day, our family gathered at my parents' house to celebrate Easter. Since I had come up a day earlier than her, we drove back home separately in our respective cars. As mentioned in the previous post, she had claimed to be alone, went to Taco Bell, and then returned home. Despite checking our banking app multiple times over the weekend, I didn't see the corresponding charge. Although it was a slim possibility, she could have paid in cash. Eager to find out the truth, I rushed home faster than her. Upon reaching home, I took our one-year-old, we each had one child, and quickly searched the house, inspecting all the trash cans for any Taco Bell remnants. The trash had been emptied the previous day, leaving anything older than Good Friday discarded. If she had indeed been to Taco Bell, the bag would have been the sole item in the trash. To my disappointment, there was nothing from Taco Bell in there. For the remainder of the day, I pretended ignorance, feeling increasingly anxious about the inevitable confrontation. I watched the kids while she went grocery shopping, and we had dinner together as a family. Despite the appearance of normalcy, my stomach was in knots, and I couldn't shake the feeling of sharing the table with a stranger. The day seemed to drag on until we finally put the kids to bed. As she took a shower and mentioned being tired, I knew my window of opportunity was closing. Me, you seem pretty tired from this weekend, huh? Her, yeah. Me, did you get some rest on Friday? You mentioned going to the mall and then Taco Bell? Her, yeah. Me, but we both know that's not where you were. Her, what are you talking about? Yes, it was. Me, please don't lie to me. Just tell the truth. Her, I swear. I went to Old Navy, then a couple of other stores at the mall, but I didn't buy anything. Then I went to Taco Bell and came home. Me, come on. Her, what, were you spying on me? Me, just tell me. Don't make this any harder on us. Her, okay, I went to the bar with some co-workers. Me, anywhere else? Her, that's it. Me, that's a lie. Her, were you spying on me? Me, just tell me. Her, I went to the office to drop Donald off after. Me, that's a lie. Her, I went to the train station. Me, for what to drop Donald off? How long were you there? Her, just two minutes. Me, that's a lie as well. 
Choosing not to reveal what I knew or the evidence I had, I avoided a premature confession that might have obscured the truth. My advice to those undergoing a similar situation is to withhold emotion and information. If they come clean, there's a chance to rebuild trust. If not, the best case scenario is a challenging battle ahead, hopefully fought against the issue rather than against each other. It was at this point that she admitted he had kissed her and she had kissed him back. When she said, he kissed me, she began crying and as she confessed, and I kissed him back, she sobbed uncontrollably. This revelation brought more pain. At this stage, I wasn't even angry. I was shocked, upset, and sad that she had made such choices and was now experiencing sorrow. It felt as if another person had taken control of her that night, and I harbored frustration towards that woman for making my wife sad. She explained that they went to a bar with some co-workers, and she had informed them that she needed to go to the mall. Surprisingly, he found the idea enjoyable. A married man found the prospect of leaving a bar and returning with another woman's husband's shirts amusing. So Donald accompanied her. To provide context, Donald was a colleague of my wife. He had attended our oldest son's second birthday party with his wife and child just a few months prior to this incident. I briefly met him and knew him as someone who offered work advice and served as a mentor. He also shared insights about the therapy his special needs son received, as our oldest son was undergoing speech therapy. They developed a close friendship at work, leading to Donald, a married man, following my wife around on a Friday night while his wife and special needs son were at home. We had a conversation and I informed her that I needed to leave for a while as I couldn't be around her. I suggested she call her mom for assistance with the kids the next day, knowing her mom had always been helpful in such situations. Despite her refusal and insistence on handling it herself, I knew she was too stressed to manage alone. I gave her an ultimatum. Either she calls her mom or I do. However, I couldn't stay around her and I couldn't trust her on her own, so I decided to be the one away from the house. That night, I stayed elsewhere and left for work with a suitcase the next morning, informing her that I would be gone for at least the next two days. There was no name calling or yelling, just a profound sense of disappointment in both her and myself for what felt like a failure as a husband. Returning to Good Friday two nights prior, when she was out with Donald, I called her a couple of times with questions about the kids and the shopping list for our youngest son's upcoming birthday party. Later, she admitted to telling Donald that it felt like I was her third kid during our conversations over her car's Bluetooth. Strangely, she never mentioned being with anyone, denying the presence of others, but Donald overheard our conversations. Donald complained about his wife being suicidal and possibly drinking a bottle of wine while looking after their emphasizing special needs son by herself. Meanwhile, he was out with a married woman, quite the father of the year. The inconsistency in their story emerged when Donald needed a ride back to the station, which we'll call North Station. He lived north of the office, an important detail for later. They kissed at the station for maybe a minute. However, according to her iPhone location history, she stayed there for about 15 minutes, but then dropped him off more south at a location we'll refer to as South Station because he missed his train. This puzzled me because the train first stopped at South Station before North Station. Why would he go south and miss the train for a longer period of time? There's one small note, both work in the building, empty at this time of night above South Station, and she was there even longer than at North Station. The truth about what happened that night remained elusive. To her credit, she was apologetic and offered to quit her job or let me check her phone anytime I wanted. I declined, expressing that I didn't want her to quit and didn't desire a relationship based on constant checking and monitoring. Little did I know that this was the type of relationship I was about to enter with her. Story 2 Half a decade ago, immediately following my divorce, I encountered a woman at a concert. Although she was somewhat younger than me, we connected well and she joined me and my friends at a bar after the show. The night was enjoyable and we exchanged numbers. At that time, my social media usage was limited to Facebook, mainly for keeping up with my kids' school and activities. Consequently, we never became friends on social media but maintained contact through texting. Initially, our texts were casual, occasionally flirting but lacking any suggestion of a sexual interest. Despite living only 20 minutes apart, we never met up or sought each other. After a few weeks of texting, we discovered we were both attending the same concert again, but this time in another city. It was a guy's weekend for me and a girl's weekend for her. Her friends and mine met before the concert, engaging in some bar hopping together. I noticed that her friends were younger than mine, 
and I was the only single one among my friends. Assuming they were unmarried due to the absence of wedding rings, we perceived the interactions as friendly. At that time, I wasn't seeking a relationship, and it seemed none of the girls were interested in anything beyond friendship. After visiting a couple of bars, we attended the concert with her friends having floor tickets and mine having seats. I assumed that was the conclusion of our interaction for the night. Following the concert, my friends and I went to a bar and then to our hotels. Shortly after I reached my room, she texted me, inviting me for more drinks at a nearby place. Since she was close to my hotel, I agreed. To my surprise, upon arriving, I found only her, and we ended up heading back to my hotel almost immediately. Upon returning home, she began visiting my house during the day, having a flexible job that allowed me to work from home most days. And with her job requiring travel, she had the opportunity to spend time at my place during the day. She would come over after my kids went to school and leave before they returned home. Some days she was at my house for almost the entire duration of my kids' school hours. Even if it wasn't my designated time with the kids, she would be there during that time. This arrangement characterized a friends with benefits relationship, which suited me perfectly. I was actively involved with my kids, coaching two of their teams, and this relationship never interfered with my time with them or my friends. Moreover, I wasn't seeking a relationship and had no desire for one, especially with someone younger who might desire children, as I was done having kids. I was transparent about my feelings and she was okay with it, expressing that she wasn't seeking a relationship either. This dynamic continued for almost a year until I met someone, who is now my wife, prompting me to end the F2B relationship. She was understanding about it, and we never texted each other again. A year after meeting my wife, we got married. Two years ago, I encountered this woman again at a neighborhood gathering. My wife and I were introduced to her and her husband by a friend of mine. They had recently purchased the house right next to his. Our initial interaction was not awkward. We simply exchanged smiles and greetings. I shared the details of our past with my wife that night, who, being understanding, accepted that we both had previous relationships. No issues arose. It turns out her husband is a pretty cool guy. He started hanging out with my group of friends, and we became friends as well. This year, he joined one of my fantasy football leagues, leading to him friending me on Facebook. Following that, my wife accepted his friend request and, upon perusing his profile, asked about the duration of my FDV relationship with his wife. It happened five years ago. She then showed me a recent post mentioning that he and his wife have been married for eight years. Thanks for watching.